Well, uh, on that Tasty Tuesday, uh, Bishop Sean is going to be here. And so after you eat or while we're finishing eating, we're going to get a chance to hear from him. I met Bishop Sean, if you, most of us know Russ Parker, and we were, uh, I was heading to Rome in 2017. I've been invited to the Vatican to meet uh, the Pope and all of You know, imagine how exciting that was for uh, us being small potatoes kind of people. Uh, but Russ said, oh, if you go, my friend, uh, Bishop Sean Larkin, or Archbishop Sean Larkin is there and he's doing a session. So, um, you know, it was a humongous 44,000 people or something. I don't know how many people were there. But anyway, but the point is, we made it our business, since Russ said he was a great guy, we made it our business to go and to meet him. And uh, it's interesting who was at that conference. That was the 50th uh, jubilee of the charismatic renewal in the uh, Catholic Church. And in those 50 years, uh, they went from zero to 120 million who are self-consciously spirit-filled evangelical Catholics. They don't necessarily use the word evangelical, but nonetheless, they certainly would use the term uh, spirit-filled. And there's a tremendous revival that's been happening in the, happening in the Catholic Church. And uh, some of you know, as I've traveled to Africa and to Latin America, we've tried to do, you know, we love everybody who loves Jesus. And we don't care if you're Methodist, if you're Baptist, if you're Catholic, if they love and we're exalting Jesus and his word, uh, we just love everybody. And so it's been a tremendous thing. And it was great to meet Archbishop, Archbishop Sean there. But what was interesting is because of liberalism and some of the different things uh, morally, it was interesting who was not invited to the 50th Jubilee. In fact, uh, Archbishop Sean does not have a mega church or something like this, but he's got a wonderful ministry. But in, in many ways, compared to you know, the Archbishop of Canterbury, a very small potatoes as well, except for uh, because of his relationship uh, with Pope Francis and others, and he doesn't let me say that, but because of that relationship, uh, he was there representing Anglicanism in that jubilee. And what's interesting is, some of you know, that that revival in 67, the Catholic Church, it came from the Anglican Church, or the Episcopal Church, Dennis, Ben, and all that, and it moved into the Roman Catholic Church. And so uh, Archbishop Sean is incredibly well-respected for good reason, and we become good friends. Uh, we have invited him to come and for you to get to know him, because we expect to do more and more together, whether that's official or not. But I expect in the next uh, six months, two years, something, I don't know, we're not trying to push anything, but I believe that we will be walking together in a more official way uh, in, as people get to know him. What I told him was, uh, he's got a little sense of, you know, he's got one of those little snarky English sense of humor. I say, just be yourself. We, 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 the people here, they love that you're evangelical. They love that you're full of the spirit and that they love that you love the historic church. And uh, so uh, that's my a little introduction. I want to invite Archbishop Sean to come and then I want to pray for him and then we'll have him preach to us this morning. Lord Jesus, we don't know how to thank you for the little things that you do that turn into bigger things. And, and we're so grateful for people who've been faithful uh, in midst all kinds of opposition and, and uh, uh, where life hasn't been easy, but, but Lord, people who served you. And then to, uh, to get a chance to get to know them and to, to be friends and to, to work together, we, it's, it's amazing, Lord. And that we would meet in such strange uh, occurrence even to meet in Rome as Anglicans. And so, Lord, would you bless... Uh, and continue to let this relationship flourish. But would you especially bless Sean this morning, that your spirit would come upon him. And Lord, we pray that as he prays uh, over those who want prayer at communion, Lord, that your spirit would fall powerfully. And we just thank people, Lord, for people that you send to us that enrich us and strengthen us. So uh, Lord, we bless him. Uh, he who waters shall be watered. Let him be watered and nourished as well. We ask this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Oh, and the microphone, sorry. Oh, I think it's on. Thank you. Thank you. Let's stand together for the reading of the gospel, and I'm going to invite you to turn, or it's going to be on the screen, to John's gospel, chapter 20 and verse 19 to the end. <clears throat> it covers for us two Easter Sunday evening appearances of our Lord. I happen to be reading from the NIV only because I think it scans well and reads well. But uh, 
On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came. He stood among them and he said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Jesus says it again. Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they're not forgiven. By the way, what could be clearer? You may not like it, but what could be clearer? Now Thomas, <coughs> also known as Didymus, one of the twelve was not with the disciples when Jesus came, so the other disciples told him, We've seen the Lord! Oh good, he says. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. I can do that. Interesting what qualifies us. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. <clears throat> Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Guess what, folks? You getting the idea? Peace be with you. By the way, you and I are not empowered to change the message of the gospel. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand, and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said, my Lord, and my God. Then Jesus told them, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed is St. Andrews. Now, you don't believe this poor scripture. You don't. You're utterly assured that you wanted to be there. And Jesus says to you this morning, you are more blessed by being here than in that room. That's a John Wimberism. But we have to read the scripture and let it hit us. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And this is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Please be seated. There are some peculiar things out there at the moment that are supposed to be the gospel. Those of you who have lived long enough know that it's not true because it doesn't match up with the word of God, with the scripture. And a few weeks ago I was in a community meeting with numbers of communities in the UK and I was there to do a particular job of work, not really to do anything else. And they suddenly stopped and they said, would you please tell us, from all your, trouble, from all your travels, what is the word of the Lord? Now, I'm not saying I've got the word of the Lord, you haven't. But I said to them, it's easy. In the Western church, we have lost the gospel 
and the power of the cross. And this was supposed to be a charismatic meeting. But the cross of our Lord inherently has power. I can tell you one healing story. This comes from a Catholic mass. The style would be very different, very orderly. And afterwards, <clears throat> the priest there said to me, I'd like you to spend time with somebody. I said, sure. And I asked him, what do you want to say? He said, oh, I've given up on church. I said, well, that's funny. You're sitting next to me. And he told me a story, and it, come, it went back to Vietnam. <clears throat> now, of those that I've met who fought in Vietnam, and I know there are ministries over here that really help people, I do not want to know, by the way, please hear that, I do not want to know what some people saw. I do not want to know what some people did. But this man who loved Jesus sat beside me and he said, what I did and what I saw, God can't deal with. And it was a Catholic church, so there was a big crucifix, you know, one with Jesus on it, which I love to wear because people will come up to me and they'll say, don't you know he's not on the cross? And I'll go, uh, no, I don't in the sense that the cross, once sufficient, uniquely for all, has its power at 11 o'clock this Sunday morning. The cross is still doing its work where God and man perfectly together said, you cannot get to heaven, but we can take you effectively. For we will take, and I'm talking we in terms of the Trinity, we will take your life and we will give you the life of God. Not a bad deal, folks. But anyway, this man, as he sat there, I thought, oh my. And then I got clever. And I say that properly, I thought, I haven't got very much to say to him. <clears throat> so I said, can you see the crucifix? He said, oh yes, you can't miss it. All eyes as you walk in that church building is on the crucifix. I said, when you're ready, please would you tell Jesus that that which you have done and that which you have seen is too big for his cross. Would you just do that? And the man, powerful one of your vets, looked and stirred, and it seemed like an age. And I said nothing. And then he looked, a little tear comes down his eye, and he simply said this, I can't say that. And I said, I know. God has brought you here that you will see that his cross is bigger than your need, and of course I should say your sin. He hadn't held down a job for years within two days he was reemployed, reconciled to the church. And I did absolutely nothing except do my job. Brothers and sisters, look at the cross. Now, when you read John's account, there are certain things that recur, and these are there because he wants us to believe. And we, we see in those accounts, nail prints, speared side. Those marks that have been put there by sinful humanity, 
and now transferred in the very presence of Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, into heaven. He took with him something that we gave him. He didn't reject it. He took it. And why he did it? Yes, it is because of his great desire for you. There's no question about that. But there has never been a moment in the existence of the community of God where the Father, Son, and Spirit haven't been in perfect communion and love with one another. Now that's your calling. That's the church's calling. That's the high standard that God is bringing us to and calling us to, that we live the life of God and it is seen. And so on that first Sunday evening, Jesus comes and he talks about forgiveness of sins. And of course, baptism being intimately linked with forgiveness of sins. God's power coming to enable us not simply to begin again, 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 but to have his life within us. And so as we see this, we see that we are to be that people who will pass on the forgiveness of God. That's our message. But sometimes, let me give you another example. Now, a friend of mine, years ago, it broke me. I want to be gentle with this, but I'm just telling testimony so that you can get to know me a little bit better. But one morning, my friend rang me up and he said, I have committed adultery. This was my true reaction. You couldn't possibly have done that. But of course, we're all capable of anything, aren't we? Just give us the right, wrong set of circumstances. The moment that you think you don't need God's grace and rely on it, we do not presume to come to this thy table, but we do trust. The moment we hit out in presumption, I could never do that, we're probably on great dangerous ground. But you see, I'm just trying to tell you my reaction. And I, I went to see his wife, and she is standing at the doorstep, lovely lady, faithful lady, and she's standing there screaming at me, I forgive him, I forgive him, I forgive him. I said, no, you don't. I said, you have no idea what's happened yet. We can take forgiveness and make it a mantra. And forgiveness is going to be a lifestyle as well as event. Now, she will come through to forgiveness, but with content. What I'm saying is this, this is, you have been sinned against. Oh, come on. You have. Now, we're not here to swap sub-stories. My sinned against is bigger than your sinned against. My sinned against is more painful than your sinned against, but your sinned against is pain. You have been wronged. And that's not right. It's unfair. It's unjust. And where's it all going, ultimately? The cross is unfair. The cross is unjust. But this is a war. So as they say in some of the, the songs, the wrongs we have done and the wrongs done to us. Now, I don't, I don't like that at the sense of, in 1998, the Anglican Church did a very serious thing. And it doesn't have to do with homosexuality. It stopped talking about sin. And we made it about pain and hurt, and justice. Now, all of those things, please, 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 are very, very important. 
But the cross was never put into place for your problems. It is not a self-help program. It is the power of God unto salvation. And we are not to make it less. What do you think? Only Jesus, ultimately, not only deals with my sin, but he gives me his nature. You see, the problem was not your sins. It was what made you sin. So we needed to begin again in his life, in his resurrection. What a great message we have, by the way. But in the Lambeth Conference of 1998, sin begins to disappear. Once it disappears, you don't need a savior. You just need Jesus to do what you want him to do. And we're not made for that. We're made for God. We're made for him in his image. And so is his church. So there is a place and there may be things in your life that you are carrying that you know are wrong but there'll come a day in the words of C.S. Lewis all wrongs will be righted when Aslan comes into sight. But as of today you and I have to live in this overlap and I was talking to Bishop Ron the other night. I was talking to one of you. I get confused. I know who Bishop Ron is, but it's lovely to meet so many of you. Oh, look, there's Fred. Um, <laughs> but, but over the years, people come to me and they say, oh, Sean, the Christian life is so hard. And one of the things you're going to know about me is I'm going to be with you at some stage and I'm going to laugh and it will be totally inappropriate. So I'm just going to apologize out on the front end and you'll just have to forgive me. You have to forgive me because you're supposed to. It's in the book. (laughs) But I just thought I'd say that. But here's the point. No, the Christian life isn't difficult. You've never found it to be difficult. You have found it to be impossible. Oh, no. If it's impossible, I'm going to need the Holy Spirit. To do what is not possible. And you Americans should love this. This is the gospel of God wants something more for your life that is bigger and better than you could ever imagine. Amen and so he does. But it's not based out of self. It's based based out of the life of the Trinity. God has much more for his church than we could ever ask or imagine. Let's get into it. Thank you, there's a Christian in the house. Who was the yeser? I haven't got any Pentecostals because we'll have a hallelujah out of this before the end. Now, Thomas, what a great believer. Now, for whatever reason, Thomas was not there on the first Sunday evening. But by the second Sunday evening, they're all back in exactly the same place, being still believing that if they've got a padlock on the inside, they'll be safe. <coughs> oh, good. Now, I've thought, of, co- of course, as to why Thomas wasn't there on that first Sunday evening, and we need to say a couple of things. Number one is we don't know, but this is my conclusion, shopping. You know, when the going gets tough, the tough goes shopping. This I know they would still need to eat. They stuck together as a fearful community. I don't know why he wasn't there. Maybe his personality type. You know, I did the Myers-Briggs thing at one point in my life, and it came out like this, J-E-R-K, okay? (laughs) Let's get that down. Actually, I want to say, I found some things helpful, because I understood why I like to pray in certain ways, so it's not quite as knocky as you might think. But this I have to believe from the scripture. Thomas was not there because Jesus didn't want him there. 
Now, what is one of the things you most hate about God? Nothing, Sean. I love him all the time. Liar. <laughs> Let's just go. I'm quite enjoying this now. But anyway, here's the point. What is one of the things that you and church life we most dislike about God? His timing. His sovereignty. <laughs> Because deep inside us, we want to go back to the old life which believes into Jesus, but when the push comes to shove, we're going to trust ourselves. And I know that one of the scriptures here that is so important to you is Jesus inviting you out onto the lake. And your response of, Lord, if it's you, we're coming. But the temptation is we will always go back to self Because we find trust such a hard issue. We find sometimes trust in other people. Again, if we sat down and we talked to each other, each one of us has broken trust with another at some stage in our life. Yeah? Cool, you're also blinking holy. But I have. I don't say that, aren't I clever? But there are certainly people who have deeply wounded me because they haven't pulled through on what they said. But God invites us to put our hands into the life of his hand when every day, 24-7, that we may learn trust. In the Roman Catholic world, and Bishop Ron said, just tell a few stories like that too, the Sunday after Easter Day, they have what they call Divine Mercy Sunday. Divine Mercy Sunday is this. that we are reminded that we are all in need of what we don't deserve. And pass it on. But it's also a place where God wants to keep us because part of our faith journey is the ability to trust him, guess what? When we see him and when we don't. When we have a sense of we know exactly what you're doing, Lord, and I, there's a great, one of my favorite bumper stickers. I, I've been over into your nation many times since 1986. But I remember one in 1986, which I thought was great. If you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. Nice. Now, it's not that God's against our planning. And he's not. But I doubt that very few things in your life have turned out the way that you thought they were going to. But in some ways, they're better. They're richer, and you will look back and say, I wouldn't have missed that for the world, even though there may be significant pain in it. So here's Thomas, back now. And Jesus comes again, which tells us that he hasn't been with them all week in the way that they can see him. But Thomas also was not terribly open at one level to the testimony of others. (laughs) Notice that? Now, there's a good side about that because we always tend to get on his back. But over the years, you know, I, people will come back to me and say, were you at that meeting? And they'll say to me, oh, it was great! And I think, yeah, and I wasn't there. That's probably why God was so great in the meeting. But I'll ask them a question. What was so great about the meeting? They'll go, it was great! Yeah, I've got that. <laughs> what was so... And what they're telling me is they've had an experience. Now, folks... I'm the last person to put down experience. But this is J.I. Packer. Because a Christian has an experience does not make it a Christian experience. 
Hinduism, that is. But the charismatic church is in danger of interpreting everything as the Spirit of God. And it's not. And the arbiter of that is how I feel about it. Not the word of God. So anyway, here's Thomas, and he's, he tells them quite straight, well, unless I get to see... Oh, look, we're back to what happened on Good Friday. Unless I get to see nail prints, I'm not going to take what you say. Now... The other side of that is, is we do want to be encouraged by one another's testimony. But our testimony should not be, I've had this experience and you need it too. I can take you to a lot of people who will talk to you about God, but I doubt they know him very well. That sounds awful critical. Two weeks ago I was in Romania... With a man, I, I've been in many Romanian prisons. We won't explain why. Just, but I've been in 40 Romanian prisons. Many of the folk that I've met subsequently spent time in those prisons. Now, I'm not suggesting that I want to do this. Some of their theology is horrible because I'm the soundest man who walks the earth. Their theology is horrible, but listen, I will sit with them hour after hour after hour, after hour, because when they talk to me about Jesus, there's a depth in there that I know absolutely nothing about. Does that make sense? I know nothing about this depth. And you, my brother, I'm just going to bathe, give me another cup of tea, and I'm going to listen to you all day long. Sorry about your eschatology. But I don't say that to them. Because Jesus is in the room. So there's a sense in which our testimonies are built. A week later, Thomas joins them. The doors were locked. Jesus came and said, peace be with you. Everything's doing good between God and man. Listen to this. Thomas, put your finger here. Jesus had heard Thomas's request. You get the point? Thomas, in that week, had not seen Jesus. Jesus comes into the room and answers the request of Thomas. Hallelujah, he's looking through you. That's a Ross Parkerism. perfected by us both over a snooker table. But he's listening. He's walking. He's alongside. He's with you. He's in you. He, 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 he. It's all the gospel. It's Jesus, 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 Jesus. And you... I'm pretty sure there'll be some here this morning. I don't want to over pull teeth. But you're not really sure that God hears you. Oh, yeah, he does. Be careful what you say. Maybe we want to pray into that a little bit later if appropriate. Put your finger here, see my hands, reach into my side. Stop doubting and belief. And... There's no record in John's gospel that Thomas ever needed to do what he said he needed to do. Isn't that remarkable? That when God comes on the scene, everything changes. I think the way John set it up for us here, Thomas is down now, as it were. My Lord and my God. And that becomes the confession of the church. Jesus does say, stop doubting and believe couple of minutes on that, then we'll close out. Doubt is not your enemy. What's the opposite of faith? Unbelief. And many of us get caught into a web that every time we have a doubt, 
We think that means we have a lack of faith. It's not true. Please let light shower on your doubts. You can have your doubts. Again, back to C.S. Lewis. Lewis said it's easy. <laughs> Good for him, by the way. He just said, just learn to doubt your doubts. There's some real brilliance in Oxford, as Bishop Ron knows. Doubt your doubts. Rank unbelief is difficult. But you don't have the thermometer on your faith. Stop doubting and believe, says Jesus. So doubt is going to be with us all our life. Cheer up. And you're only going to find out if this was any good after you're dead. <laughs> Love it! Now the one who has died and is resurrected with nail prints and the scar is the one who has given his life to his church and therefore you. And there is coming a day when you will get a new container, a new body, and you will then be saved. So brothers and sisters, I can say to you today, biblically, you're not yet. Because if you think you are fully saved now in that sense, you'll stop. This morning we saw baptism. Wonderful. It's a gateway. It's a beginning. It's part of God's grace to us to move on. So do I believe in justification by faith? Yeah. But the gospel is more. I believe in sanctification by grace. And I believe that one day he will get a safe home and we will be saved. And anybody who walks with Orthodox Christians will find that out rather quickly. You see, you have been made not for something more than you think, but for someone more than we have yet understood. And there will come a day when he's going to look on you as beautiful, present you to the Father, and the Father's going to say of the Son, my son, job well done, or words to that effect in heavenly language. We're looking forward to well done, good and faithful servant. But Jesus is going to get the fullness of that accolade and the fullness of that accolade, I know you don't believe it, is us. Christ died for you. He died for me. He died for his church. It says so in the book of Acts. Brothers and sisters, Easter is both event and ongoing process. How are we doing? You, Lord, who are resurrected, come into our minds afresh. Our experiences of this day, the joys, the pain, the aches, the sorrows, the longings, the things that we're utterly assured now could never happen on this earth come. You for whom all time is eternally present, be here. And Lord, as we continue to worship you and receive you in your bread and in your wine, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for such a wonderful salvation as this. And may we, Lord, together bear the marks of the cross in the power of the resurrection, in the knowledge that Jesus Christ was crucified, dead and buried, rose again, ascended on high, pourer out of the Holy Spirit and the soon coming King. 
Lord, it seems to me you've got it. <laughs> so like Mercy Sunday, Jesus, cause me, cause us to trust you more. Amen.